and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. A very, very good afternoon to you all. Welcome, everybody, wherever you are in the world, to the Masai Mara Game Reserve here in Kenya. Now, I am Patrick, that is James, and if you have any questions or comments throughout this broadcast, please do send them in. Use that hashtag Safari Live or the YouTube chat stream. So, I have been very lucky to bump into these Owinos. They were literally coming down the road towards me. I was, uh, we were going to check, we thought, we, we, we did see a black rhino, but it must have disappeared. Uh, we saw it from quite a distance away and came down to investigate. And then on the way to, we were going to go see that leopard that David had this morning that's on a kill. But on the way, uh, I was literally intercepted by these guys coming towards me down the road. Now, it's been a while since I've seen the Awinos, and once again, they show up when we least expect it. It's... It's almost as if it's a rule now that if I go looking for the Orinos, I won't find them. But if I'm in that area and I don't want to find... Well, not, not, not want to find them, but if I'm not looking specifically for them, well, they're here, they're here they are. But uh, it's great nonetheless to be here with them. It looks like there is the two youngsters, or the two younger females up the top of the term... Well, one at the top of the term mound. This one lying down, it looks to be a lychee one of the older females and missing is butternut and the male so butternut i think can be accounted for seeing as she's been seen with a mating lion recently also yeah they do look quite young they do um the i mean well yeah the, the two younger females are about two years old and then lychee, I believe, I'm not sure actually, we don't know how old they are. They, they showed up in migration a couple of years ago. But yeah, that leaves uh, butternut and the male unaccounted for. But yeah, butternut, as I said, has been seen at mating, but I don't know, the male, he's about two years old as well, a little bit older than two years old. And maybe he was forced out by another male. Everyone's saying it's sad news about Butternut. Yes, it is unfortunate that she did in fact lose all of her cubs. Hopefully she does get some more successfully from this courting with the male and we can have some more Owino cubs to look forward to. I guess that's the, uh, I don't know, the positive side to all of that is that, you know, there will be life, it will go on, and, um, you know, there's not gonna not be cubs. Well, hopefully there's not going to not be cubs around. That's, uh, they looked pretty, uh, I mean, they didn't look, completely famished, but they looked very mopey and unenergetic. I suppose it is a pretty hot day today. It's 28 degrees Celsius, 83 Fahrenheit. Rambo, yes, I do imagine these flies must be annoying. I think they, they must just be able to, well, as we can see right there, a little bit of annoyance, but I mean, they must be pretty good at staying calm. I know if I had that amount of flies on me, especially on the face as well, I would uh, not be that relaxed. You can see every now and again, they'll give a twitch, but they're generally pretty okay with it. I've seen heaps and heaps of flies on some, some lions, especially those that have just fed, and they just seem to get on with it, which I guess when you're exposed to it every day of your life, what, other, what else could you really do? It's not like these lions can pack up and move overseas. <laughs> Well, it looks like these guys are staying pretty flat, so I think I'm gonna go and try and find this leopard. And uh, whilst I move off, let's go down to Tristan and say a good afternoon to him down in Juma. Good luck, Pat. Hopefully you'll be successful in your endeavor to find leopards, I know. David, I think, found a leopard with a kill I think it was today, this morning. So maybe Pat will be able to relocate on that and find it, which will be very exciting, given that leopards in the Mara 
Uh, not the most common thing that we see there, but certainly have been fairly good over the course of the last, I would say, probably three, four weeks. We've had quite a few nice sightings of leopards out in the Mara side. Anyway, my name is Tristan, as Pan mentioned. I've got Senzo on camera this afternoon, and it is a warm welcome to the South African side of things um, for the evening, well, afternoon slash evening show. Um, hopefully it's going to be a wonderful afternoon this side of the world. We're just getting going, and it's fairly kind of overcast for the most part. It's not hot or cold. It's kind of nice temperature to be out, actually. Uh, there's a little bit of a breeze blowing, so it's very, very pleasant out here. And we're going to go and try and see if we can follow up on the multitude of leopards that were around this morning. So there was reports that there was tracks for Tandi and Tlalamba. Tingana was seen. Um, there was a report of a female leopard on Little Gari coming this way. So lots of kind of leopardy things going on, but we'll take it as it comes. We're just generally going to bumble slowly and see what we can find. We already found tracks for what looks like little Clalumba um, coming down Gallego shortcut, but I'm going to leave those for Jamie and Herbie to follow up on. Um, they look like from last night, so she could be quite far already. So we're going to leave those for her, for, well, for them. Um, oh, there we go. So she was at the dam cam at around two. That must be exactly where her tracks go, and I must just let Herbie know because otherwise they're going to go the wrong way. I was checking Gallego Pan in case she came here for water, but she obviously walked straight past and. Funnily enough, actually, at about one o'clock, I was down at the camp. I quickly had to go drop something off for Ali, who's obviously at Viatella, and the squirrels and the Franklins were going crazy. And I was thinking to myself, must be a leopard and must be, you know, Tingana. But actually, now that I think of it, it's the perfect time frame for little Clolumba to have made an appearance. So that's exciting news. We'll definitely drill and try and kind of figure out what's going on there and see if we can find maybe dad and daughter are together and they are sitting around. I know that Tingana lost a kill last night, so maybe they got a scrap back and there's some sort of piece up in a tree and Clalumba's just kind of scavenging from dad. So let's go see. Let's see what we can find. It's at least something to work with. It's definitely going to help. Now Herbie's calling me. Go ahead, Herbie. So, Mary, you say lots of nice things, well, lots of leopard things going on, and that's always a good way to start our day. Essentially, yes, it is always very, very good. Now, Herbie's also telling me that he's got tracks for a leopard at a dam cam um, going south, so obviously for Clalumba. But I tell you what, that's probably one of the better multitaskings I've done because I had Emma telling me a question and Herbie giving me a message and, some, and speaking to all of you, and I managed to somehow figure out between everybody what was going on there. Don't know how, but we managed it in some way. Okay, copy that, uh, Herbie. Apparently she was seen at about 2 o'clock at the dam, so I'm sure she's not too far. So Herbie's going to look. I always check this termite mound on our right-hand side here. There's a termite mound with a big jackalberry, and I've seen Tingana use this fairly regularly, as well as Hosanna. Both of them liked this termite mound. In fact, actually, I'm sure Karula's been seen on here, and Tandi, I've even seen her once on this as well. So it's a termite mound. Whenever I drive here, just check at the base of that tree. It's nice and shady, and you can see fairly kind of foliated, if you want to call it that, and a nice little place for a leopard to hide. So you always got to just do a double check at that mound, make 100% sure there's no leopard lying on top, because they can blend in incredibly well under that massive jackalberry. But alas, no Tingana today or Clalumba, so let's carry on. Let's head back towards sort of the dam area and then we'll cut towards the Mulwati. I wonder if she hasn't gone to those pans um, on the sort of southern side of the dam wall, although there's no water there, so we'll see. Anyway, all right, so I'm going to head that direction. I'm going to see what I can go and find, and with the help of Herbie, I'm sure we'll come right with one of our two leopards that were in the area. In the meantime, back up to Pat, see if he's any closer to the leopards that he was following up on. Still making my way to where this leopard is. I am sincerely hoping that it hasn't uh, left its kill just yet, or that if it has, that it's going to come back. I have heard that it was a baby eland that it killed, or an eland calf that it has hoisted up in the tree. So I can imagine there's quite a lot of meat to finish off there. That was the, the other day I found that shepherd's tree male. He was uh, trying to hunt an eland calf as well. So there are a lot more eland around in the area at the moment, especially through that burnt area. For some reason, that's just attracted a lot of eland. 
Uh, so, yeah, it's good to see them around, but obviously offering a bit of opportunity for prey, as are a lot of animals at the moment, as uh, it is the start of the rainy season and all of the animals are starting to, if not, it's, if, well, it's not really ever their breeding season here, but most of the mammals out here will give birth around and now when the rains are starting to come in and, gee, they have started to come in. Natasha, well, I was just getting to that. So the uh, so it's been quite sunny during the morning, and then we've just had intense rainfall in the afternoons, and uh, there's a couple of rain clouds looming at the moment. So perhaps it might come in a bit later as well. But yeah, it's just starting to. So it was dry for about a, yeah a month straight when there should have been at least a bit of rain. It's pretty much dry every day, and now uh, the last few days it's just starting to really come in a bit more steady. And so everything is giving birth, and, well, this is giving opportunities to predators as well. Yesterday, whoa, I had the sighting of a lifetime yesterday morning. So I was up at the Tanzanian border, and the border brothers were there. Actually, first, no, first I showed up and there was a solitary cheetah. I didn't know which uh, identification it was. And it was on a kill eating a Tommy. And then we left that and found the Border Brothers about 500 metres away. And they tried to hunt a wildebeest calf, which was pretty cool. And they got up, uh, one got on the face. Sorry, I'm just going to turn down here. Uh, one got on the face and was attacking the neck and the throat and the other one was kind of getting in and I thought that they had it. And then out of nowhere, it just got away. But then after that, all of these hyenas came in and kept on chasing this calf. So it was, sorry, I've had a vehicle swap today. I usually drive Pucker and I'm driving Keto and the reverse is on the completely different side of the gear shifter. So anyway, it was, uh, it was absolutely insane to watch, absolutely insane. And so the, the hyenas just kept chasing and chasing and chasing, and eventually we lost them over the Tanzanian border. So I don't know what actually happened with the rest of the hunt, but it was adrenaline, pure adrenaline. It was crazy. And then earlier on that morning as well, I came across two servals on the road that looked to be a mating pair. And then literally five minutes later, I found three servals, which looked to be a mother and two, two young. So very, very successful morning yesterday morning. And uh, yeah, I was uh, <laughs> very lucky. And I, I mean, I was also with the River Pride in the morning as well. Lily's saying it sounds crazy. It was crazy. I was oh, very tuckered out afterwards. It was pure excitement. And then, yeah, so the River Pride, they kind of went in a warthog. I mean, I wouldn't say it was a full-on attempted hunt. They just kind of half-heartedly chased a warthog as well. So I was just with cats all morning, doing cool stuff, seeing cool stuff. It was epic, absolutely epic. So hopefully, well, this afternoon's already been off to a good start running in to me arenas. Hopefully, 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 this leopard is still about. Well, I shall try and manifest this good luck into something greater. So great, in fact, that it goes all the way down to Jamie Patterson in Juma. So hoping that we're going to manifest some good luck. What a wonderful way of putting that. I think that's something that I will use in future. Thank you very much, Pat. Um, very good afternoon to you all. My name is Jamie, and this afternoon Sebastian has just walked into a branch that's gone straight across his face. And we're out on foot looking for Tlalamba, which is why I'm speaking quite softly. I'm convinced that she's here. Uh, as you know, those of you who let us know that she was seen on the dam camera just about an hour or so ago. She came out over the dam wall from this jackalberry, and I'm convinced she's here somewhere. So Herbie's just gone up ahead so that we don't, all three of us, go bumbling straight into her. So I just want to go around a little bit to where I can see her. That's on his own. There's three of them. Anyway. 
way, so we just do it carefully. Could be. We're going to go. Got a fit with our signal. I think it's just because we're down below the dam wall. It's blocking the signal. So while our way to a better spot, or if you pop across uh, to Pat in the Mara, to. Ah, uh, we do apologise for those Grammy Grammy McGremlins, but I guess you are stuck with me for a little bit longer. So. Uh, uh, um, what other stories do I have to tell? I uh, saw another Ross's Taraco today, which has been very nice. It's becoming a common occurrence. There's a very nice, <coughs> excuse me, there's a very nice walk right near the camp uh, that goes down along a river. And because we've had a bit of rain, it's been flowing very hard. So I've been having a lot of peaceful strolls through there. And uh, the habitat is a little bit different there, obviously, than a lot of the habitats that we have down here. We are a little bit lower altitude wise and the Obviously, not being on an escarpment, then the, it's not getting the same amount of sunlight and just a whole different kind of habitat. So there's some cool stuff to see up along this walk. And yeah, saw another Ross Taraco today, which I was very, very pleased about. So there's, there's another story to keep you entertained while we head on down. Um, 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 what else has happened recently around here? Lauren's back today which is cool, so we'll be able to see a bit more of her. Chaos and Perfection, I hope I got that name right. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble with my earpiece today. Um, what is an eland? Well, an eland is a type of antelope. It's a very large antelope that we get here in the Mara. And, um, well, they are very cool. I will I'm kind of in the area that they have been around lately, so if I do see one, I will stop and show you. But they are quite a large antelope, actually, and they are not rare to see here, but not as common as, say, maybe gazelle or impala. Uh, 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 uh. So, I'm not too far off where I heard this leopard is. I just taken an alternative to please do bear with me Rosalind how long are their horns I don't actually know an exact number but if I had to guess from the ones that I had seen probably about 70 centimetres, mm, so about 20, 25 inches, and they're, they're quite straight, the horns. They are a whopping, whopping antelope. I think the, the greater eland is one of the largest, or the largest antelope in the world. Mac Randall, what is the most interesting thing I have learned about the Mara? Ooh. Probably one of them is that it, ne it didn't actually used to always be like this, very open. It was actually once, uh, I've heard, quite a dense habitat. And through three things, um, fire, uh, human clearance of the trees, and... And what was the third thing? Fire, human clearance of the trees, and elephants, and elephants as well. So the combination of those three things have helped to keep this landscape kind of very open now and not very dense. And the trees that have remained are the ones that were tall enough to kind of escape the fire, uh, the fires that took everything else out. And so, yeah, I guess that's a very interesting fact that I've learned about the Mara. It's hard to picture this being, being dense. I mean, we do have areas of dense vegetation, generally, well, almost always around some source of water, mainly the river, but for the most part, it's a very open place. Lenny's saying it's a great question. It was a great question. And, uh, yeah, 
it's uh, nice to think about these things because sometimes we get so focused on the animals we forget about the place that we are actually in and well without this place the animals wouldn't be here without this habitat but uh, it's very interesting how the continent of, has, of Africa has been shaped by humans. It's uh, almost been completely altered. I mean, obviously, most of the topography and the geography is going to remain similar. Or, I mean, even in mine places, maybe not. But, yes, it's really changed. But then as well, the animals have changed with it. And so it's just this dynamic kind of dynamic cycle. Uh, I can never tire of looking at this escarpment. It is so beautiful. Tom, yes, I do wonder what the Juma used to be like. I'm sure it wasn't always the way it is as well. Actually, I think, don't quote me on this, but I've heard that it, through there may have used to have been tropical, and I'm talking years and years, like a long, long time ago. I just. I, I don't, I'm not sure whether that's correct or not, but don't quote me on it, but it just rung a bell in my head that perhaps it used to be perhaps rainforest or perhaps it was just dense forest. Um, but yeah, but well, the interesting thing about Africa though is obviously because of continental drift, a lot of the countries have moved very far from, where, or a lot of the continents at least, have moved very far from where they were originally. But Africa has only kind of shifted a little bit uh, up and down. So it hasn't really moved a whole heap in relation to all of the other continents. And despite this, it still has drastically changed over the years. It is interesting. Well, I am closing in on this leopard. I will get it there eventually. But it seems like Tristan has his tracking boots on this afternoon. And let's see what he is trying to find. Well, Pat, we are pretty much also trying to close in on these leopards and just try to figure out exactly what's going on. There's obviously, there was this kill that was stolen by the hyenas from Tingana and it seems to Lalamba has walked straight to where that is. So Herbie and Jamie are inside where we, well, to the right of us, busy kind of investigating and they said it was something big that they managed to steal. Um, and they're just trying to see if maybe there's a piece that they managed to steal back at the moment and if maybe little Lalamba is somewhere around kind of hanging about. So we're just double checking. We've checked further south and um, we've gone central and then we went around and now checking Tundam's Road just to see if there's any sign of her heading out this way but so far nothing so I think she must still be inside here and to, as for Tingana I'm not sure where he went either I didn't find any tracks on him Vubu Road going northwards uh, it's not to say he didn't he might have easily gone that way and I've just missed them the roads are not exactly that easy to see tracks on at the moment so um, as far as I think is that we should theoretically have two leopards around here and hopefully Tingana managed to steal a piece of his carcass back. Often it does happen with leopards when it's a big meal, so something like an adult male impala or a nyalo or something like that. They often will let hyenas eat for a while and then when the hyenas start to get a little bit full, they then run in and they grab a piece and then they put it up into the tree and that can sustain them for a good little bit. Um, and so it's very possible that that's what he's done. And so now it's just to figure out where that could be because obviously a carcass gets dragged around quite heavily by hyenas and that makes life a little bit more tricky so her tracks go there um, I wonder I know Herbie's on the track so I mean he should theoretically be able to f kind of point me in a better direction I'm just gonna go around back to central again Danza and MC, you wondering how Hosanna is since this reminds you of him given it's at the dam and Tingana, Hosanna, well, um, we don't know to be honest, as far as I understand it there isn't, there hasn't been a sighting of him since the 20th of March, which is obviously quite a long time ago, um, it's not very, very sort of common that Hosanna goes that long without being seen, but there's no need to panic, um, Tumba often disappears for long 
periods of time and um, doesn't get seen and kind of then pops up again a few weeks later and so it very well could be the same for Hosanna. Um, in fact both of them were seen within a few days of each other and that's the last time either one was seen. So I'm sure they're around, I'm sure we'll get an update on them at some point. Maybe they've just been checking out new areas and kind of scratching about or maybe they're on their way back or one of them at least is on their way back to this area. We kind of cling to that hope that that's going to be the case but whether or not it is actually the case is probably pretty slim. I mean I, the chances of us finding you know Tambo Hosanna coming back is getting decreasing by the day unfortunately and I say that with a very heavy heart to be honest it sucks when our little leopards who we know so well and have grown up with who've given us so much you know move off or go somewhere else it's never that nice at all <sighs> Columba where are you I'm just trying to think where she would go I mean her normal route from the dam is towards the east yes Emma very profound Emma's telling me if you love something you have to let it fruit go is Emma's quoting sting songs now um, and so we'll we'll have to I suppose um, at some point but it would be very sad to to let things go um, I don't like the fact that our boys have gone I wish they were still here both of them were very special cats so I'm hoping that they will come back at some point. Now you're going to have to forgive me because you're probably going to look at the back of my head a lot and you're going to go back and forth with me quite regularly. And that's just because I'm trying to double check every track we've got here. It's very difficult after not being out in the morning to know where people drove, what tracks were seen this morning, what weren't, um, and just generally what's going on. So it's going to take a bit of time for us to kind of figure it out and then we're going to have to go very, very slowly in order to try and see if we can find any sign of these cats but I wonder if maybe the kill wasn't made somewhere around here and then dragged down into the into the ditch I'm trying to see if I can find a drag mark that crosses central I didn't see anything earlier and if it was a big kill then we should theoretically be able to see tracks quite easily going over unless of course all the cars drove over the tracks this morning then it's going to make life a little more tricky Daniel, you're saying, are we sure Tingana did not um, hoist the kill, um, given that um, hyena started? No, well, he obviously didn't hoist it if hyena's got hold of it. But what I'm trying to say is that often they'll get a piece back. So it might be a leg, it might be the neck, it might be, you know, rib cage. Um, you see it regularly with leopards is that they lose some of it, but they'll then get some piece and then kind of try and hoist it and then get it up. So I have been checking the trees in case um, there's any sign of a carcass dangling can be quite tricky when they've got little pieces because it can be very difficult to actually see those pieces especially if it's just a small leg that's tucked in a very foliated tree it can be quite tough to actually see a leg or something like that and so we're gonna have to just just kind of go slowly and and keep checking and it's gonna help that Herbie's on foot because he certainly will be able to pick up tracks and follow tracks a lot easier than what we are going to be able to do um, and hopefully that will be our secret weapon and we'll manage to kind of find what we're looking for this afternoon but it is going to take a bit of effort and we're going to have to try quite hard and hopefully we'll get it right I don't know why she couldn't have gone and drank at the dam camp at three o'clock when we kind of departed the camp because that would have made life very easy um, and if she's walking around and she's already drank water then she's not going to go looking for water now so that means checking all the little water points is probably not the best idea unfortunately for us I'm just checking this side because she often likes to come this way after she's been at the dam cam right now we haven't found anything as yet we are still bumbling about but it sounds like Pat has found something so let's shoot you back across to the mass I'm Mara. Yes, we have found this leopard. We can see it down here in the grass. Very exciting stuff. Now, I did say that I was wanted to, before the end of my leave, find a leopard. Now, I did achieve that goal already, but I didn't do it whilst live broadcasting. So here we go, a goal accomplished. Very, very happy. And there is that kill up in the tree there. 
told that, yes, it does seem to be a young eland up there. Very fresh, actually. And we can see that not much of it has been eaten right now. I mean, it looks to be the, what's that, the right, yeah, the right leg seems to have been taken off completely there. And hoisted very high, actually, up in this tree today. Very high up. No one is guessing to that. Obviously, one of the advantages of being a leopard is you can put your put your kill up where lions and hyenas aren't going to get. Monique is happy. She's saying, "Yay, yes!" I'm also very happy, Monique. I'm very, very happy to have found a Mara lion. I mean, not a Mara lion, a Mara leopard. So I've, I've been told also that this is not the shepherd tree male. I have just showed up here and I can't get a good look at it, but I have been told that this isn't him. But funnily enough, it is very close to where I had the shepherd's tree male hunting the other day, mere hundreds of metres actually, so very, very close. So I uh, wonder whether this male has moved in. I did hear that last time I heard anyway, the shepherd's tree male was quite a way away. Uh, so... Hmm, I wonder if this one has moved in. I'll just move around so we can get a better look at this guy. So I've had a lot of cats over the last day. Colleen, I don't think lions would try and play on the tree to get the kill. So lions don't often climb trees. They do definitely do it, don't get me wrong. But especially a kill hoist at that high, I don't think would be worth the effort for a lion. But, I mean, also never say never out here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so most likely not, most likely not. But, you know, they could do it. I mean, they are physically capable of climbing trees. And if they wanted to steal the kill bad enough, I suppose they would. But generally speaking, the leopard's domain is the trees. And, uh, well, unfortunately, I can't get any closer to it right now because then I would be obstructing other cars in this sighting. So, unfortunately, we're just going to have to look through the long grass for the time being. But here's a new angle of this poor... Oh, was that... No, I can't even... I'm second-guessing whether I... <laughs> whether this is the same way around I thought it was. I think I've, I've seen this thing the opposite of the way around. It's hard with carcass when they're twisted up through a tree to know which limb is coming from where sometimes. Oh no, we can see that tail at the back there. But, I don't know, from this angle it just looks like it's, it's missing its head. Oh, there, no, we can see it's, yeah. MGN, correct, yes, the tree is a leopard's storage cupboard, making use of nature the best that they can. So, um, let me just see if I can get a better look here. Um, 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 um. I think where we were just before is actually, we are actually going to be able to get a look. Uh, I've kind of obstructed our view even more by coming here. So let me go back so we can actually look at this leopard. So it's good, to, yeah, I was saying, so in the last last 24 hours, I've seen lion, leopard, serval, and cheetah. So I'm very cat happy at the moment. Very, very cappy. <laughs> yeah. Got both of the pantheras as well. Panthera pardus, that is the leopard, and Panthera leo, that is the lion. Okay, well, it's not much of a better view, but it's, uh, at least we can see this, <laughs> a few spots here. Chris, it would be. I mean, it is interesting that there is a, yeah, well, if this isn't the Shepherd's Tree Mail, which I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I haven't been, heard anyone been calling it that. And yeah, so um, it would be quite interesting. I wonder if he's been chased out or not. But it is also 
cool to see the leopards kind of in the more open areas as well. I've always, when I've looked for leopards out here, always looked in the closed habitats. And now both the sightings I've had have been out, out in the open. Not open, open, but generally they'll stay around trees. And when that one was hunting the other day, it was using a lot of these bushes, a lot of these shrubs that are around for cover and actually doing it quite effectively. It stalked the eland for quite a while without being detected. And this one obviously did a great job of stalking out here as well. So uh, yeah, I was saying the other day, it's what I think is happening is with all these cleared areas that predators are moving through and just, you know, having an absolute banquet at their fingertips, being able to move around a lot and, I mean, well, not move around a lot, but see a lot of animals moving around them. And so therefore, you know, it's kind of, where do I go, where do I go, what do I hunt, what do I hunt? And so I'm seeing a lot of hunts in these areas, but I'm not seeing a lot of successful hunts in the area. So, I mean, the trade-off to having the kind of sure the grass is that you're also easier to see, even though it is easier to see. Well, I'm going to stay here with this leopard and hope that a better viewpoint opens up. And in the meantime, let's go to Jamie, who is looking for, well, one of this species. Well, all we found so far in terms of paw prints are the tiny, tiny little paws. I'm afraid far too tiny to be... Which one are we on, Zeb? Is that okay? Far too tiny to belong to little Flalama, no matter how tiny she is. This is, in fact, the track of a genet. So that's a no. It's definitely not her. I can't shake the feeling that she's watching us, uh, that she's just watched us walk past her. I'm almost convinced of it. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if she followed us for a little bit. But what we're doing at the moment, I can also tell you that there was a bushwalk here, <laughs> judging by the, the number of human tracks moving about i can what we're doing at the moment is uh, tristan's picked up on tracks coming out from behind the dam wall and coming south towards twin dams chile pan ingwe alley all of those sorts of areas that Tlalama really does like i'm not convinced though i really i i feel like she's in that area where hosana always likes to be what we did find down there unfortunately we couldn't show you because of our signal but what we did find was the drag marks of tingana's kill then you could actually see scuffs and you could see hyena tracks, leopard tracks, all sorts of things where the two animals had a bit of a war over that kill last night. And judging by the fact that it's all gone, I think it's safe to assume that Tingana lost. Now, Tlalamba, I think, would have heard the sounds, would have stayed away, would have heard Daddy calling and thought, oh, maybe, maybe he won. Maybe I should go and investigate, just in the same way that she did with that kudu kill, which was in exactly the same place that Tingana had. So I would say that I think she's still there. Herbie's convinced she's come this way towards um, Ingwe Ali. He could, of course, be right. He also knows her far better than I do. I still think she's watching us somewhere around here. So what we tried to do when we moved through that area was I tried to let Herbie move ahead. <laughs> Vicky said that she's sneaky like that, our little princess. I think her, yes, you're absolutely right. I think that her instinct, as young as she is, I think that her instinct is to just stay. When she sees something, yesterday when we tried to find her with the drone and tried to drive in when I decided to leave her, I watched her body language on the drone and she stayed and she stayed and she stayed until we were right next to her but we had a log between her and us and we couldn't see her. As soon as I went around the log, she got up and moved away and I'm convinced that's what's happened to us now, personally. Herbie thinks she's somewhere in here. I think, <laughs> I think she lay down and just watched us. And I mean, with just ears and just eyes, probably put her ears back just as the same way that we've seen Hosanna do, we've seen Shongile do. She probably put her little ears back and watched us walk past. What do you think, Seb? Mm. Mm. No, alarm calls. no alarm calls, no movement, nothing. And that hair raising feeling that something was watching us, convinced of it. 
It is this very strong feeling in my, and in my experience, one should not ignore those feelings because they're often very valid. It's some sort of, I think it's some sort of residual instinct that we have as human beings, whether it's hearing or something that our, our bodies pick up upon. It's happened to me more than once on walk, and I've seen something at the last minute, or whatever the case may be. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching us there. And it's not a scary feeling, it's just the hairs on the back of your neck are on end because you don't quite know where it is. And I know it's either Tingana or it's Tlalamba. Tingana, he's, he has a harder time hiding. You know, he's double the size easily of Tlalamba, so it's much harder to hide. Where Tlalamba, I think, probably watched us. I think Tingana would have snuck away. Oh, Herbie's popped out of the bushes. We're going to catch up with him. And Pat doesn't have to go looking for a leopard. His leopard is there in front of him. Let's go and enjoy it. Well, I sort of actually do have to go looking a ride now. Still just, ah, oh, just sitting here. Just sitting, waiting, wishing. Well, I was sitting, waiting, wishing this leopard would get up and do something. Then maybe we'd see something cool. <laughs> Bit of Jack Johnson for y'all. But uh, the carcass hasn't moved. I'm sure you're all pleased to hear. And, well, I think that's why it's resting right now. So, yeah, I think, yeah, it's just taking a rest now. I mean, it is, so, well, it's not the heat of the day right now. It's starting to come in through the afternoon, but it's still got quite hot and digesting food and eating, you know, it does speed up the metabolism and warm the animal up a little bit. And so I guess a well-needed break isn't such a bad thing for this leopard, especially when it is secure up in that tree up there. There's not really much that is going to get up there and get it. That's, well, oh. Ooh, so it sounds like it. So sorry, sorry, we just hear some vehicle related noise and there might be one that drive through shot in a second. I know we're up in the tree, that's fine, that's fine. Well, I think if this leopard doesn't get up soon, I'm going to go back to those lions, maybe, and see what the... Oh, we know. Okay, so it sounds like Tristan has found a leopard anyway, so we can get a better look at that. Let's go and check it out. Indeed we have. We've managed to find little Clalamba, who was given away by a monkey's alarm calling, but I don't think it was because of her. The monkeys where they alarm calling is not for her. I just wanted to try and see if we could find something at Chelapan, and we found her, and then the monkeys started shouting. So I think there's another leopard around, especially because her behavior just changed all of a sudden. She got up and walked, and then she started going into a stalking manner, and then lay down, and she almost looks like she's talking, but I can't see if maybe Tingana is also here. I mean, we know he was in the area this morning, so it's very possible that he's around as well. So what I want to try and do quickly is just get into a slightly different position and just see if we can see what's in front of her because the way the monkeys were alarm calling, it must be that they saw something around the Milwati and the way that she's twitching her tail and kind of looking around tends to suggest like she's seen something rather than stalking a prey animal. It's almost like she's seen another leopard which I just want to quickly check hello my girl nice to see you been looking for you for days just want to check what's in front of her I don't see anything but it wouldn't shock me that Tingana is here as well I mean his tracks come this way and the way she kind of just stopped Jamie is apparently is sulking that we managed to find her. I don't see any sign. There's a little mud wallow here, so I thought maybe he was lying down somewhere in that area, but I don't see him at all. And she seems to be fairly relaxed. You see anything, Sins? I don't know, just the way she kind of stopped and then she was sort of looking over her shoulder and then kind of 
being all sort of cutesy, which is what they often do when they spot another leopard. Um, but let's just stop here. Let's just enjoy her. If there's another leopard, hopefully it'll come towards where she is. It's, what's that there? Is that just grass in front of us? Yes, it is just grass. Monkeys are still shouting away and going crazy, but they can't be seeing her. Where they are is far down the Mulwati, and the angle from where we are in the bush and the terrain wouldn't allow those monkeys to have seen her unless of course she was right out in the open and walking on the road in which case they may have seen her but we didn't find her on the road we found her kind of tucked up a little bit um close to one of the pans here either way nice to have found her hello girl you've been very busy the last few days you've been walking all over the place and it's nice to kind of catch up with her where she is actually just going to sit still for a little bit but you can hear the go away birds they're shouting as well and there's Franklin's. So I think there's something walking very close to where we are, not right where um, she is. I think there's something maybe in the actual Mulwati or on the road. But the go-away birds and the Franklin's and the way kind of everything's shouting tends to suggest there's an animal that's out in the open. And she most certainly isn't out in the kind of clearing that she'd be seen by so many different things. But I believe a lot of you are very excited that we've caught up with her. It's nice that she made an appearance on the dam cam as well, which means she's given maximum kind of viewership today. She's um, earned her keep for this afternoon's drive and I'm going to enjoy spending my afternoon with her. I absolutely love this little cat. I think she's super, super cute. And of course, following her from that first, first sighting that we had of her when she was that little bundle that could hardly sort of move and was sort of almost falling down the hill before with Tundi sort of glaring at us in the background to now where she's this pretty little girl who's growing up so nicely. Now you can hear the squirrels are going, go away birds are going. I think there's another leopard behind us somewhere. Can God you say she's sitting in the poop? Well, it's dry elephant poop, so why not us? Maybe it's a comfortable place to sit. You can see how alert she is as well to the sounds that is around her, but I'm not sure that squirrel can be alarm calling at her. Can Maybe just hear the monkeys in the distance. Tingi, are you also here? Wouldn't shock me if he was around. He loves this area as well. Seen him here many, many times, um, hanging about this place. And this is exactly where we have, some of you might um, remember where we had Shadow and not Barbara and Tingana all meet up. We're in exactly that spot as well. Um, it's the same sort of area that we are in the moment so wouldn't it be quite nice to have Tandy and Tingana arrive that would be quite cool and have all of them together right she's moving on off so we're going to keep up with her and see where she goes we might as well you know keep up with the leopard that we have rather than go and look for a leopard that we don't but if Jamie's around I wouldn't put it past there being another leopard in the area just the way these squirrels are shouting and monkeys are calling and go away birds are alarm calling I reckon there could very well be another leopard around. Anyway, let's keep up with her. Cheek, cheek. I mean, she, she looks like she could do with the meal. Sorry, I was just looking over my shoulder because I can hear those squirrels and those monkeys alarm calling behind me still. Um, you know, she's, she's a slim girl and she's not the biggest um, of leopards yet. But she doesn't look like she's emaciated. I mean, if you look at her now, she looks healthy. It looks as though she's been feeding well. Uh, she definitely could do with something to eat, but she's not super skinny by any stretch of the imagination. And look, there's a little tail going up. The classic little leopard catwalk where they have these little sort of bouncy feet and waggly hips that go down. They would do a very good runway kind of impression when the little white tail that just lifts up in the air and shows everybody that they're not hunting. Well, thank you very much, Lola. But that was on cue. And she lifted her tail to show us exactly how she does it um, as she walks along. So that's just telling everybody that she's not hunting them. Isn't that cool? She's so growing up. <laughs> Got long legs now as well. Right, let's just catch up with her a little bit and see what she's getting up to. You see, she's definitely spotting something at the moment. Her tail is twitching. Look at her now. She's, you see her on the road? Look at this tail and look at the way she's kind of stalking along look 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 you see she's definitely spotting something I don't, what it is i have absolutely no idea but that tail is going at a million miles an hour she's kind of quite crouched now 
um, hidden behind the grass. Now, there's so many other alarm calls around here. It could be a prey animal or it could very well be something like another leopard. But the way that she's in that pose there doesn't suggest another leopard. That tends to suggest more that there's some sort of prey animal that is around. I'm just going to quickly see what she's busy doing. Let's just see now, because I might lose view of her. If she gets into that thicket, it's going to be very tricky. Look at her going. Look at her doing a little leopard crawl. Isn't this wonderful? I'm just worried we're going to lose visual of her, and I don't want to disturb her hunt by going too close. There she goes scooting along. Oopsie. <laughs> no, she's gone, and I don't think we're going to be able to find her again um, easily. She's going to try and hide now, and I also don't want to get too close that I might ruin anything for her. So we're just going to edge forward. Where did you go, little girl? AC, how do the hunting skills progress? Just purely out of practice. Um, that's how they do it. I'm trying to see what she sees. I don't see anything here. Oh, it's impalas, look, Sid. There's the impalas on our right-hand side that she's busy watching. So she's gone in somewhere here ahead of us. Um, I can't see where she is now, but just through those bushes, you can see there's a few impalas that are milling about. Now, those impalas are going to be on high, high, high alert with these go-away birds shouting, monkeys alarm calling, squirrels shouting. They certainly aren't going to be very happy about it. So there she is straight in front of us, Sense. So in that little gap between that green, you'll just make out her back slowly moving. You see the spots there? There we go. So she's just going to go through that gap. I don't really know where I'm going to put myself at this rate because... Um, all right, let's just double check here how we're going to do this. The Impalas look like they've moved down towards the Mawati. Let's just reposition sense. She's already gone on the other side, and the impalas, they've also gone as well. So it seems as though she's lost interest. The impalas have moved off. Right, now I've got to figure out where she went. She went across here, so we're going to just check. Now, there she goes. She's being sneaky in the thicket there. All right, I'm going to catch up with her, and I'm going to try and see where we can go. In the meantime, though, it sounds like Jamie has something to show all of you that is an enemy of Clalamba. Killed baboons, actually. In fact, they are watching us with as much fascination as we are watching them. Anyway, so much for my whole speech about the, you know, that feeling on the hairs in the back of your neck with something's watching you and all of that nonsense. I mean, it was probably a lizard or something, mm. or a bird that was watching us as we went past, or perhaps nothing at all, and I just really got involved with my own story. But anyway, Tristan's found La Lumba. Herbie and I have had a sulk. We're over it now, and we are watching a troop of baboons who is spending a little bit of time playing King of the Castle around this fallen tree, as well as the silver cluster leaf next to it. And I've been watching them for a while now. And one comes up and sort of shoves the other off periodically and switches roles, and then they all start again. And we've had a lot of baboon sightings over the past few days. It's, it's actually quite a joy. Look at this little... Can you see the one on the tree there, Seb? Yeah. It looks like that branch is about to fold up yeah. under it. It puts me in mind of a cartoon, and I can't think where I saw it. Or it must have been somewhere in Kruger on a postcard or something, or a, a Gary Larson Far Side cartoon. Something along the lines of baboons watching people in a safari park and being equally fascinated by our behavior as, as we are with theirs. I really enjoy sitting with baboons because they're always up to something. Emma thinks that she knows the one I'm talking about. I, I, I would be amazed if you could find it. <clears throat> Tammy, we are now quite far from Tristan. Look, we were the plan was always to go and check Chelepan. It just so happens that we were a couple of steps behind Tristan. We're now, 
I would say, a good kilometre or so away from where Tristan is, possibly even a little bit more, maybe even a mile, for those of you that work in miles, and for those of you that work in kilometres, I'm sorry, I've never been good at mile-kilometre conversions. Miles don't really make sense to me. I wasn't raised that way. Feet, for some reason my parents always spoke about things in feet, despite the fact that South Africa is a thoroughly uh, metric country. You see their heads popping up every now and again. You know what they're eating at the moment? And now, of course, because I've raised it, I don't see a good example around me. But the large fruited bush willows are fruiting. And of course, being large fruited bush willows, I mean, if you can't get the name, get the clue from the name, then, you know, might as well stop watching Safari now because it's going to go badly. They've got large fruits and they've got these four winged pods that they um, are very similar to those of the red bush willow, the russet bush willow, but much, much larger. And that's what the baboons have been eating recently. And I came upon a total disaster zone outside my bedroom where one, they'd got into the large fruited bush willow there and they just stripped it completely and left branches, leaves. I mean, it could have been worse. They could have gone into my room, which they do do quite a lot. But in this case, they just made a mess on my veranda. I really need to sneeze. I'm, st I'm struggling this afternoon. I don't know what it is. I don't know what I have. I don't know if it's to do with the baboon. Maybe the baboons came and rolled on my pillow or something. But something has really, truly <laughs> had disabled me at the, in terms of being able to see. All right. Well, it's a leopard-themed afternoon. You know what? We're not going to look for leopards at all because I feel as though you're spoiled both with Tristan with Lalamba and, of course, Pat with his leopards. Well, we're st starting to get some visual here. So it's just started to kind of prick up a little bit in the last minute or so but still making it hard for us. I've decided to be a little bit patient this afternoon and stake it out and hope that it does come up to the tree. Um, those lines did look pretty flat before, so I think we can get away with leaving them for a while. And I mean, I have spent many, many drives with lions here in the Mara, but with leopards, well, not really at all. And to see one feeding would be very, very great. But uh, while we wait for stuff to happen, why don't I quiz everybody? So uh, if you think you know the answer to this one, use the YouTube chat stream or the hashtag Safari Live. So my question is, what is the mating system called in leopards? So it's, uh, I mean, a relatively easy one, but uh, should at least be able to test a couple of you. And while we are uh, waiting for the answer, we do have something very nice that has strolled in over this side. Some Ellie's. So it looks like we have a mother and a calf. And, oh no, there's four. There's, okay, a little bit of a herd. Very nice. So, oh, looks like, oh no. That one was just whacking its food. It looked like it was dust bathing for a second, but <laughs> what's this one noticed? Oh no, it's just sticking its ears out. It looked like it was, uh, looked like it had found something that it was a little bit distressed about, but it doesn't seem like there is anything there. I think it's just being, just being a youngster, just being a young alley, doing what young alleys do. This one trying to take off here, trying to catch flight with its wings. <laughs> no, it's just flapping its ears to cool itself down, although the wind is starting to pick up this afternoon. I can see a little bit of a front starting to come in. It's just peeking over the escarpment now. So fingers crossed we don't get caught in the downpour, although I am welcoming any rain at the moment at the same time. It's a bit of a bittersweet thing when we're out here and it's raining because it does hinder our abilities a lot. But at the same time, it is good for the ecosystem. It's good for the land and, well... It's very nice. All right, well, I'll still be waiting around for the answers to this quiz. And in the meantime, let's go back to Tristan and the little princess. Well, I'm not sure following is the right word at this stage. Being dragged through Hades and 
hell is probably more like what's happening at the moment. She's on a serious mission this afternoon, and quite frankly, if she keeps this up any longer, I'm actually going to leave her alone because she clearly is wanting to find food, and I don't really want to disturb her. She's not hunting at the moment, so she gave up on the impalas and is just walking, but if she starts to stalk again, I'm not going to go chasing after her. Um, there she is there. Girl, it's like you stop long enough for me to catch up with you and then you start walking again. You've learned from your brother. Hosanna used to do this too. You used to catch up with him and then he would start walking. And then you kind of, he would sit and wait for you as if to say, come on, you're slowing me down. And off she goes. But like I say, if she starts hunting again, I'm not going to crash through thickets like this following her anymore. Um, we'll just leave her to herself. Ultimately, she's still kind of creating a life for her herself and learning about hunting and those kind of things so it's tricky for her to be able to to find kind of food and those kind of things so I don't want to disturb her too much and I just need to get hold of Rex quickly also it looks like she's laid down which is exciting now sorry Emma there's people talking on the radio and you asking a question at the same time so I missed it completely sense. I'm going to try and suck our stomachs in as we go through here. Emrolf, I just think because leopards do it better, that's why. So their crawl seems more stealthy um, than lions. Um, lions obviously do do it and, and theirs is pretty good, but I find with leopards it's just so much more kind of stealthy the way that they move. That should be good sense. Oh, thank you for dying, lying down, Columba. Um, and so that's why I kind of refer to, I think it's referred to as a leopard call. I just think they do it that much better and they get so much lower at times than what the lions do. Now just give me two seconds. Rex, Rex. Yeah, Rex, I've managed to relocate Columba now. She's um, between Vulture's Nest and Yala Road South. You know where the Scotia is on the Termite Mound? Up here. I just come um, sort of straight to the west from there. I'll get your audio. She's just lying down now. So we just needed to get Rex in um, because Rex and, and the ladies that are here at the moment have been dying to see Clilum and she's been giving them the slip. So he's very excited to get you. So we just wanted to sort that out quickly. But uh, thankfully she's slowed down a little bit now, which is quite nice. Um, she was on a serious mission and I was getting a bit kind of, you know, to the point where as I was saying just now, I didn't really want to disturb her day. Um, and so as soon as she can kind of calm down and, and sort of, if she does start to move again, we're probably going to leave her and let her carry on. But what's interesting with her is, it, and it shows why she's been so tricky to find of late. You know, she went through a phase where she was pretty kind of, um, I don't know what the word is, reliable in terms of she would just find a water hole and she would lie there and she'd be quite happy to spend her whole day lying about at the water hole and in fact, days on end. Whereas her movement of late is showing that she's far more mobile at the moment. What the reason for that is, is very difficult to say. Uh, maybe she's getting pressure from Tundi. Maybe there's something else that's causing her to be a lot more mobile. But I mean, if you think about it yesterday, she was seen on our far eastern side of our traverse. Then today she has basically covered the entire sort of central section and we are already looped back to about halfway back to that eastern section again. So she's covered a huge amount of distance very quickly this afternoon already um, and tracking her would have been an absolute nightmare if we hadn't gotten lucky and managed to kind of find her at Chelapan and, and her kind of sitting there. So if she had moved and we'd got you a little bit later, we would have really, really, really struggled to be able to actually pick her up and, and to be able to follow her. Um, what I would like though is, uh, it might be quite nice for Jamie and Herbie if they don't feel like doing any tracking of Tingana, is to go back to where she was and just to go and see her tracks from where she actually did leopard crawl. I wonder if you can see her belly hairs scraping on the road. I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case because she was so low at one point. It was very cool to kind of watch her going as low as she did. Have you tied yourself out, little one? I'm not surprised, you've been marching all day. Because she came from Gallagher Shortcut, so she came from north of the, the camp and walked very steadily south. And now is going back in a sort of northeasterly direction. But she's looking good, isn't she? She's gotten rid of a lot of those ticks on the back of her head. There's 
not as many as there were a few um, weeks ago. Remember when Trishala had um, little Tlalamba and there were the sort of 18, 19 ticks on the back of her neck, whereas now she seems as though she's managed to get rid of a lot of them um, and is in looking in very good condition, considering she's a young little leopardess who's by at this stage doesn't seem to be spending very much time with her mother at all in fact i wouldn't be surprised if that relationship is all but done now um and so very very cool to see that she's surviving on her own francesca um when she will she be of breeding age well i mean it's theoretically possible from when she's about two and a half um but most females generally are breeding at around three and a half. That's the sort of average, three and a half to four years old. But it is possible from two and a half that she can breed. Um, so we've still got a long way to go. If you think about it, that's if she's three and a half, it's still two years until she'll have her first cubs, which which is quite far from now. Um, at the moment, she's you know still got other things. I suppose actually not two years, a year and a half if it's two and a half years old and um, sorry a year if it's two and a half years old and, and two years if it's three and a half but you know it's it's, it's still a lot of va variables and it's impossible to say whether she'll breed earlier or later um, there's a lot of different factors she's still got a long way to go before she can even think about breeding she's got to carve a territory out for herself she's got to make sure that she's got an area marked off she's got to find den sites she's got to you know kind of fit in within the system of this area and, and try and kind of squeeze out and eke out a territory of her own which is not going to be easy um, you know there's a female to the north of her that skittish female in Biffles Hoku even though we don't see her much is a, is a nice sized female um, she's territorial you've got her mom that's territorial here there's Kuchava there's Subui there's going to be Subui's cub there's Shudulu there's Tiani um, so there's a lot of female leopards in Kanyeni Monzo who's also going to be around little female so there's going to be a lot of female pressure in this area and it's going to be difficult for her to eke out in existence the one thing she's got on her side is that her mother is still actively patrolling this territory and really kind of moving around everywhere and doesn't seem to be at this stage as far as we know because obviously we see only such a small portion of Tandy's life um, doesn't seem to be in any aggression towards Tlalamba yet and allowing her to stay around in this area and so what we have to hope for is that Ting uh, Tandy is going to give protection for long enough that she's big and strong enough for her own accord to protect herself and eke out a little kind of territory of her own that she'll slowly expand as Tandi gets older and Tandi's kind of area starts to shrink. Remember that Tandi is getting um, much, much older and much longer in the tooth and I'm pretty sure that this litter that we see now from Tandi will probably be the last one. Now, give me two seconds. Yeah, go ahead, Rex. Um, to the west of the Scotia um, yeah just come to you know or even the Balanites the big Balanites is a good place to come uh, she's got company there's a hyena that's going to join us shortly it's just that's why she stood up and is looking around it's not ideal that this hyena's kind of rolled through here because that might get her going again she was so nicely settled Let's see where the hyena's kind of just in the background there. You, it's very difficult to see it. Just kind of slinking through behind there. And see, it's not that they let hyenas steal their food. They don't want hyenas to steal their food. But ultimately, you must remember that hyena is a very powerful animal. Um, it's big, it's strong, it's got a serious bite on it. And so fighting with hyenas is... is really a silly idea ultimately it's easy enough for a leopard to go and get another kill um, and to go and hunt and to potentially find another food source whereas if they fight with hyena and hyena gets hold of them and bites their paw or bites their forearm they can really break those bones and, and for a solitary animal like a leopard it's incredibly dangerous um, for them to try and survive that way they're really going to struggle to be able to you know find food for themselves so much easier just to give that food away and to not really fight too much with it um, with hyenas and then try and get a meal of your own or be clever and pay a patience game with hyenas which is to let them feed and get themselves full and then to be quick and stealthy and swoop in and grab a chunk for yourself and go up into the tree um, 
What you will find though is that there's some leopards that learn very, very quickly um, and they learn that, you know, ultimately they need to hoist their kills as soon as possible um, and then they all have a much better success rate of keeping their kills and hopefully little Kalamba has learned that. I mean, she's dealt with a lot of hyenas in her life and certainly has from what we've seen, the propensity to put meals up in trees. We know the two dikers that she's killed, she's put both of those up, um, and she's taken a number of different carcasses up and down trees, particularly um, later in her life when mom was still making meals for her. I mean, there's that sighting that Brent had where she was taking the impala up, even though she wasn't successful in hoisting it very well, she, that practice has been happening. And so it's almost like she's learned that lesson that she really needs to pay attention and be able to um, sort of make their way in well make their way up into trees and then be able to keep um, it out of the way of, of hyenas so you know some leopards are better at than it at others um, tandy seems to target much smaller prey animals in order to be able to um be able to kind of eat those without having to get it up in the trees and if she does need to get it up in trees she can do it easily whereas other leopards tend to you know have a different system shadulu seems to also be one that likes to hoist a tree and when they're younger it's much easier than when they get older you know as they get older the heavier the carcass is the harder it kind of becomes right well it's nice that she's decided just to settle down maybe she heard me that i was going to leave her alone and she didn't want to not have company this afternoon and so has decided to lie down so we're going to enjoy the fact that we get to sit with our little princess in the meantime though i'm going to send you back across to pat and see how he's doing with his leopard well, yeah, so I'm also kind of enjoying chilling out over here at the moment. I'm just uh, having a look here at what is coming in at us. So it doesn't look too bad at the minute, but uh, it does seem like it is starting to get darken and thicken. And uh, something that's already quite dark and thick is these elephants here. So the leopard is still inactive, so these elephants have been a bit of a blessing at the moment giving us something to kill the time with they haven't been doing much except eating but hey don't we just love seeing elephants anyway so emma did we get any answers to the quiz has anyone gotten it yet uh, it shouldn't be too too tricky i'm sure someone's gotten it oh no one's gotten it yet. Might have to go into hints soon. But uh, let's see what answers we have had at the moment. Polyandrous says Amanda. No, no, it's not a polyandrous. It's, uh, it's close though, close though. Almost there. But uh, it does start with a P. There's another clue. It does start with a P. But that's not the word I was looking for. So it's really... Uh... Love 3 is saying polygony. No, no, still not yet. That's, uh, that's, uh, that is close again, but, uh, well, sort of close. So polygony is when males will mate with several females. So that's giving it another clue by process of elimination. So although it starts with P, it doesn't start with poly. That's another clue. Doesn't start with P-O-L. So that should make it even more specific there. So as we gaze upon these Loxodonta Africana. It's a very, <laughs> very cool scientific name to say. Loxodonta Africana. Loxodonta Africana, Loxodonta Africana. <laughs> Uh, get a little bit carried away here. I uh, really don't see elephants eating trees or browsing much here at all. Obviously in Juma we see the destruction of elephants all over the place. Well, 
destruction is, is just a way to describe it. It's not actually destroying, destroying the habitat. I mean, they probably, I mean, no, they are destroying the trees. The trees are destroyed. They're dead after they get ripped down. But you know what I'm getting at here. But yeah, in Juma, it's a common sight. And here, I mean, they definitely do do it, but uh, I suppose there is this abundance of grass here and elephants are pretty adaptable in their diet and that they can switch between grass and bark and trees and roots. And we'll see this quite drastically change in Juma, so much so that it will actually affect the colour of their dung in the rainy season. It will be a lot different than in the dry scent. Love, no, love and Shane, was it? Love, love and Shane saying promiscuity. Yes, you got it. So that was the answer to the quiz. That is the mating leopards. The mating system of leopards is promiscuity. Love and Shane. Love and chains. Okay. And so promiscuity, which is when females and males will mate. So females will mate with different males. And what's going on there? and males will mate with different females. So it's a little bit of a free-for-all, I suppose you could say, promiscuity. Promiscuous girl. <laughs> Ugh. Ugh. <sighs> Obviously, though, these two elephants would be feeling very different things right now due to their body size. So this little one would probably be heating up and cooling down a lot quicker. <laughs> Everyone's loving how musical I am today. I'm musical every day. Uh, I love it. Love me tunes. And, uh, well, it's nice out here. I can just switch between the sounds of nature and the sounds of music. <laughs> well, I'm going to start off a bit of a choir with these elephants and sing along so we can get some music and the sounds of nature. No, not really, but I will send you down to Jamie, who might sing us a song while she's walking around. I've never heard Pat sing. Is he is he a good singer? Is it should we get him to be our um, sort of dedicated wild earth singer to all things wildlife related? <laughs> oh no, Emma says no, maybe not. Now the last time I was on walk, which was two days ago, we. I gave you a nearly impossible track quiz, and I don't think that this one is nearly as impossible. What is this? What has made these lines along here? They're, that's probably where they're the clearest. What created these? What drew the lines in the sand, so to speak? It's very clear and quite, it should be quite easy. It should be something that you get pretty quickly. Oh, did I just ruin the other one? No, I didn't. I didn't. And the answer is not me, no. The answer is not me. There's another track here, over here, this here, in my circle. Carries on, but it's sort of relatively clear there. There's two tracks there for you to identify, and it should be relatively easy. It also gives me the opportunity to try and sit down for a second, because I am completely... It's debilitating how much I'm sneezing. I'm sorry. I'm trying to... I'm trying to contain it <laughs> as much as possible. I have no idea what Emma just said. Can you? Do you have any idea, Seb? Not a clue. I heard. I think I heard ants. It's not ants. Ah, uh, the Lorax said ants. No, it is not ants. Ants. I'll try and look for a track for you from a column of ants. Ants create a very almost snake-like track, so it's always a lot wider than something like this. This is very, very thin. The clues around it, though, remember what we spoke about, about looking at the the whole picture when you are tracking? There are The clues to what made it are right there in this image. Painted Wolf says snails. No. Oh, and I, I actually... Oh, no, I can't tell you. I was about to say there's a there's a very clear answer that you're going to get shortly because it's... I just saw something happen, but I can't tell you what it is because it'll give it away. Not snails, no. Snails leave slime and a wider track. Millipede's right. Kristen, well done. This is a millipede track here. 
it's very very clear it's a it's it's a sort of an almost railway line track that millipedes create and it's it's very smooth there's no real sharp corners or anything like that so you're absolutely right well done that is a millipede oh i've messed it up now but it's too it's like a train track a very very small train track and it's even and it is the same width no matter where the track goes it is always the same width because of course millipedes legs are always the same distance apart from each other <laughs> no, me too. Emma and I are on the same. Emma and I often have a very similar thought process with the absurdities of life, and both of us were imagining a, a millipede going along, making little choo choo sounds, maybe blowing a bit of steam off into the air in the early morning. But we've got to take advantage of these tracks now because very soon they're going to be going. It's getting harder and harder on bushwalk to find you insect life, to you know daze and dazzle you. Hence why now we're starting to resort to things like track quizzes. Come on, this one's easy. You must know this one. I'm sorry, I have to try not to sneeze again. Doing my best. I am, I promise. The, the clues are here. Nope. Kathleen says termites. Tis not termites. In the in interest of expediency, look at the holes, because one of them is actually active. This hole and this track are made by the same creature. Now, that I know you know the holes. I know someone will know these little holes. And this one is active, because I just saw a whole heap of sand being thrown out by the creature that lives inside it. And these tracks are made by this little creature moving from one spot to another and digging itself a new hole. So these are all the old ones over sort of around here. Is that right, Sev? Yeah. yeah. The old ones here. And then a creature's got up and moved. Yes, Lauren says ant lions. Bravo, Lauren. This it would be fun. You really want to Herbie, you want to track individual ant lions? You really want to test your tracking skills. Well done, Lauren. It is ant lions. Uh, I reckon that this one went in here. And this one came... This is. It's, it's like I'm doing a little maze. So that one came from there. That one did this. You have to untangle all the threads of the tracks. So an ant lion, for those of you that don't know, is a larval stage of a type of insect... And what it does is it creates these little conical pits in the sand, around very, very soft sand. It removes all the stones and leaves them with quite sheer walls of thin, not thin, fine sand. And what happens is when something like an ant, I'm not going to take this poor chap and throw him to the, the literal, the, the proverbial wolves. Mm. But what happens is an ant walks too close to the edge, it slides down, the sand gives way at the slightest little bit of weight, and the ant lion then reaches up with giant jaws and munches it. And they can stay in that larval stage for extended periods of time. It really depends on how much food they get before going through a metamorphosis and turning into a creature that looks like it looks like a fantasy dragonfly if that makes sense. So, and dragonflies are pretty fantastical all on their own, but these lace wings have these long, long wings that are see-through. They're transparent with black, almost like lace work coloring to them. They are beautiful. I'm sure we might find actually find you some tonight, or we could find you some tonight. So that's what they turn into, but they start out life as a truly ugly duckling in the sense that they are very hideous, tiny little things with giant mouths. Now, I'm sure that Tristan will agree that uh, lace wings, what are, no, they're not called lace wings, well, they are. Lace wings or ant lions are truly beautiful creatures. Perhaps not quite as beautiful as the little princess, though. Yes, Jamie, I would agree that most definitely Clolumba is far more pretty or far more beautiful than what an ant lion would be. In my eyes, I'm afraid ant lions have very big jaws and aren't very well they don't have beautiful spotted coats do they although they might be a lot more active than what <laughs> Clolumbe is at this stage although we got lucky this afternoon and at least she was fairly kind of 
mobile to start with and all of that energy has now meant that she is taking a really nice little rest in the long grass and it's no wonder you don't find them half the time because you think of where we are right now and it, it would be almost impossible to have located her in this even if you had followed tracks it would have been quite tricky because the ground here is is it's not very soft and there's a lot a lot, lot of grass around the area and it makes it very very hard for us to be able to actually kind of find tracks through the block and so it would have taken a lot longer had you not been able to kind of see her coming into this area and it's like i say no wonder you don't see um kind of spot them sometimes also there's no view from any road anywhere near here she's kind of right in the center of a little block at the moment and is blending in very very well and taking a nice big nap now i'm pretty sure this evening she is going to be out hunting um i'm 99 percent sure that she's just taking a bit of a break and once it starts to get dark and cooler we're going to start to see um her getting up and starting to stalk now what she's going to go after is obviously anyone's guess and she'll go after pretty much everything at this stage so anything from lizards to birds to scrub hairs um you know, obviously dikers and impalas and those kind of things are also on the menu. As yet, to our knowledge, we don't know of her managing to kill a adult impala yet. Um, it's possible that she has, obviously. Um, she might have been robbed a few times, and if she does kill something like an adult male impala, she most certainly is not going to be able to hoist that at her current size, and so she would have lost those meals probably quite quickly um, to those to those hyenas or to maybe even other leopards. But um, the biggest that we know of that she has managed to physically pull down that anyone has actually seen um, is a diker. So AC, you were wondering about this. Um, so diker would be the biggest that we've seen her take. Rex has seen her take a diker before and we've seen her once as well. But it's, I mean, whether she's taken impalas is obviously debatable. It's possible, um, but she's still a little on the small side. So I think it would be really tough for her to be able to bring down those kind of bigger antelopes. As for things like warthogs, I doubt she's tried. Um, warthog is probably far too intimidating at this size. Um, I think that will only come when she gets a little bit more older and a bit more experienced and she'll then be able to start targeting piglets like what we saw Kachava do. Um, other than that, she'll be sustaining probably, I would imagine, lots of scrub hairs um, would have been taken by her. Probably a fair amount of birds as well, so things like guinea fowls, franklins um, and the likes, they would have been taken and, and probably a lot of diker. Um, is what her kind of diet consists of at the moment. Um, it's, it's interesting to watch her going on hunting sort of little missions in the last few weeks that we have been seeing her. She's very keen on impalas but tends to give up on them quite quickly whereas anything smaller she tends to take a lot more energy and a lot more kind of care to be able to follow them around and be able to kind of find where they are. Now earlier when she was hunting those impalas she really had no chance and, and the reason why is what we were saying is those impalas were super nervous as they from hearing things like monkeys alarm calling, franklins, um, go away birds, you know, squirrels, they were all alarm calling, which would have put those impalas um, into serious sort of um, alert mode. And, and then any kind of movement around that, even us just driving down the road, would have been made them kind of stare and look. So that's probably why she didn't invest too much energy into that. There was just too much noise around her area, um, even though I don't think a lot of it was for her. And I certainly think that that's probably why she didn't really kind of invest too much energy. Had it been quiet and there hadn't been any sounds, I think we would have found her stalking a lot harder and a lot longer in order to get closer to those impalas because she kind of trotted after them a little bit when they moved off over the the Mulwati but gave up quite quickly and then just sort of sauntered off um, I did laugh at her though we were following her along to get to where we are now and there was a Franklin that was sitting in the tree just looking at her and it made one little kind of squawk but not even loud and she just looked at it with this deathly stare and kind of snarled at the franklin the franklin immediately shut up and just sat in the branch and watched her walk past and that was the end of that um which was very very funny but she's doesn't seem to really i mean i haven't seen her hunting too many birds um it's gonna be interesting in winter actually i'm quite intrigued to see how she does in winter. I'm just thinking she's going to spend a lot of time around for your We're already seeing what I was saying um, a few days ago is that we're going to see a lot more leopards coming towards Gallagher and Vuitella as it starts to dry out they're going to start moving into that area to drink and that means that we're obviously going to spend a lot more time with her there and I wonder if she's going to start stalking things like Egyptian geese much like what Hosanna was doing at one point or she's going to figure out the same technique that 
Rosanna did for hunting tigers. Good. Anyway, we're going to carry on sitting with her. Hope that she wakes up at some point. In the meantime, though, back up to Pat and see how his spotted cat is doing. Yes. So I did say earlier that I was going to stop to show you all an eland if I came across one, and I came across this solitary one. And whoa, don't uh, don't go thinking that this is what all eland look like. They don't all have one horn. This one has just, I guess, lost one somehow. It's uh, it's a bit hard to say whether it's been snapped off or whether it was born that way. But from this angle, it looks like it was born that way. We can see yeah, those nice spirals in the horns at the base there, and that is, or in the horn, should I say, and uh, that is because they are a spiral horned antelope. And, well, that's what they're classed as anyway. It's a grouping of antelopes, the spiral horned ones, and uh, some oxpeckers as well on the back there making it use of the giant surface area of these antelope. They can get huge up to 900 kilograms. Cossacks saying that they loved elands. Yes, the elands are great. They are very cool, actually. They're one of my favorite antelopes visually to look at. Just be, not because there's... <laughs> Kelsex is saying it's... Uh, sorry, I, I heard that wrong. He didn't say he loved eland. He said it's a unicorn eland. Yes, it is. <laughs> It is a unicorn. Let's uh, let's call this one unicorn. The unicorn eland, the rare one. It's the closest thing that we'll get to one. If you could just move that horn a little bit to the left there, it would be sitting very nicely in the middle. <laughs> so I have moved off from the leopard. Florine, yes, all we need is a rainbow and a leprechaun as well. And then we'd have all the mythical creatures together with a pot of gold. Uh, but we're searching and there's nothing there. So, yeah, with the leopard, there was a lot of vehicles lined up to actually get into the sighting. So I just thought I would leave while it is flat. I mean, that carcass isn't going anywhere right now. I don't think the leopard is going anywhere right now. So I thought I would let the other cars come in and have a look for themselves. And while, I, while they do that, I might just go and check back in, see if those lines have moved anywhere or done anything else. And so without further ado, I shall do that. But... Leopard was still in the same position and uh, the car, one of the cars that came in was blocking our view of the elephants as well. So rather than sit there with nothing, I thought, well, get out and move, be a little bit proactive. And then I can always come back later and hopefully see uh, the leopard on the carcass feeding. Or maybe the shepherd's tree male will move back in and compete. Wouldn't that be epic? <laughs> Day feed, I, no, I don't think that Elan's horn will ever grow back. It's going to be like that for life. And it may have been like that for its entire life. As I said, I'm not exactly sure how it did lose it, but I don't think that thing is going to be coming back. We get them a lot up on the escarpment. It was quite funny the other day. I was walking along the escarpment and there's a soccer, soccer pitch up the top and um, there was six eland on one side facing one way and six eland on the other side facing the other way they were just standing there grazing but if you were to put a soccer ball in the middle of the two it would actually look like two opposing teams going against one another it was uh, rather comedic to watch it is a great having all of the animals up the escarpment. They're coming up in numbers at the moment. We've had a lot of zebras hanging around, coming to camp, and the baboons, they keep their distance. They don't tend to come right into camp. There's been a lot more of those around lately. A lot of elands, a lot of impala, lots of giraffe as well, which has been really, really nice. So it's nice to just stroll around and have some game viewing on foot. You know, we can't walk around here in the Mara, obviously. And so to be able to at least do that up on the escarpment is good. It doesn't mean that we don't miss some tumour and the bushwalks there so much. Although the only problem is, is that tumour, a lot of the smaller things, uh, there's information on identification and that, but 
up here there is not so much information so I look at the smaller things but I don't exactly know exactly what they are. <laughs> anyway we know exactly what Tristan has and let's go check back in. Hopefully Pat's lions will be a little bit more active than when he had them earlier and that they'll be up and moving. Our princess is, will take a leaf out of a lion's book at this stage and is still fast asleep. Every now and then pops her head up and just looks around. There's a bit of a breeze that's blowing and sometimes she catches a scent on that or hears something in the distance. There's been a few squirrels alarm calling and the odd sort of bird chirping here and there. And so every now and then it kind of wakes her up and she just looks around, but otherwise has been fairly sleepy that's for sure but i was saying earlier that her overall body condition looks good and it's quite nice now that she's kind of slowed down that we can really kind of get a view of her coat and you can see that she's kind of got a very very kind of nice looking coat at the moment her hair is all in good condition she's not exactly covered in ticks and her general body health is good her muscular structure is good she's not got any sort of um, atrophy of any muscles at this stage just a bit of a small belly but otherwise everything looks very very good um, Timothy what is the age of a leopard in human years um, probably think it's similar to what domestic cats is it's not something I've really ever thought about or ever really wondered too much um, you know I don't think we can really kind of equate it <sighs> I mean, I know there's these calculations and I know people do these things in human years, but um, for me, it's just different. You know, cats live a certain amount of time and wild cats live different to domestic cats. And, you know, these kind of things happen. So I never really think of it in human times. I just always kind of think of it as how old they are for their own species. Um, but theoretically, um, if we had to kind of assign an age to Clalumba in a sort of an equivalent phase of life, then in, in a human, it would be sort of... I'd say she's starting to kind of go into her sort of later teens, if you want to look at it like that. So she's going into her sort of 15, 16, 17 sort of years old. Um, I'd say closer to sort of 15, she's still got a bit of time to go. Um, but she's got a bit of development still to do before she can become kind of an adult leopard. So at the moment, she'd still be con sort of considered a sub-adult um, but she's almost at that age. Well, in fact, she's at that age now where I know that um, even in Panthera, they're starting to set up her own little profile for her as a leopard that we can log independently of Tundi, which is quite nice. Um, so it's, she's made a big landmark there, and she's obviously got a few more to go in life before she's really kind of made it. But certainly her ability to make it is is exponentially been increased since every day that she's been around and the fact that she's done okay um, being on her own for so long and we know that she's feeding herself means that her sort of role within this ecosystem should should be okay it's just now about finding that territory where she can stay out of trouble from the sort of dangers of other female leopards and various other things that are out here like hyenas and lions and and all the rest we know that often um, young leopards while they can sustain themselves and feed themselves they do have close calls with other predators just from inexperience um and you obviously gonna have to watch out for that we know hassan i mean he had a close call with a little bit of fur being ripped off his tail and his shoulder so she needs to be very very careful angie um no she's not full size um she's still growing so she will reach her sort of full size Normally when they reach about sort of four years old, they're pretty much fully grown. There might be a little bit of kind of bulking out that will take place between four and sort of seven, but generally they've reached fully grown by four years old. So she's still got a bit of growing to do. She's not going to be a big leopard though. She certainly will be probably very similar build to her mother, um, which is not massive. Uh, she's pretty sort of slim and um, she's got nice long legs. So I don't think she's going to be too big um i think she's going to be one of the smallest kind of females that we have but that's fine i mean her mom packs a punch uh, even though she is a much smaller individual she's still able to pack a serious punch and so i think clalumba will be the same she certainly probably has learned a lot from tandy and she couldn't have had a better teacher she was her you know grandmother was the legend and her mother is created her own legacy in many respects i know she's not had the same kind of following as what karula's had but tundi is an incredibly impressive mother if you consider what she's dealt with over her time she's had also had multiple males come through her territory and the fact that she's managed to raise pretty much a cub out of every set 
of cubs that she's had is quite phenomenal in many respects. Um, I think she's an incredibly good mother. I know she's lost a cub out of every set bar this one as far as we know. I mean, she might have had two right in the beginning. We don't know. Um, but she's done seriously well to kind of raise one from every boat. So, Sai, how old is Tundi when she had her first litter? She must have been... I would have think now, because she had her first litter in the beginning of 2011, somewhere around there. And she was at that stage, I think about three and a half, between three and a half and... F I think she was at about that age. I must just double check, but she was, I think, about three and a half when she had her first litter um three and a half to four somewhere in between there um i'll double check it though and just make 100 percent sure i've got to remember there's so many dates from all of these different leopards and when they're their first ones that it's a bit tricky but it was somewhere in that sort of vicinity and she was uh, the amazing part about it is where she had her first litter it's it's ridiculous when you think about it now because you'll never see tundi anywhere near where she had her first one she had her first one in the rapapi drainage which is directly in front of in um so that's obviously where Nkanyeni hangs out now um, and that's where she had her first litter, which was Wabiyiza and, and the other one. The other one was killed fairly early on, and then Wabiyiza was raised. And through Wabiyiza's kind of life, she slowly shifted more to the east as Intima gave way. Um, and she started to then hang around sort of the Chitwa and Koro, Cheetah Plains sort of cut lines. That was where Tandi spent a lot of her time. Um, and then she, after that, had Kuchave in, in around Cheetah Plains. Um, I'm sorry, Bahuti was the next and that was more in Koro and then Chava on um, Cheetah Plains and then obviously Tamba on Chitwa and then Tlalamba on Juma so she's done quite a push um, to the west of where she had her first litter um, back to her sort of natal territory as Shadow did the same Shadow just came the opposite direction and eastwards and they both then kind of met up in the central area what's also been very fascinating with the whole kind of change and things at the moment is how Shadow and, and Tandi's sort of divide has pretty much stayed the same with Shadulu and Tandi I thought Tandi or Shadulu each one one of them was going to make a push to try and get a little bit more glean off some, some more territory but it's actually pretty much the same um, to what it used to be um, and even with Karula and Shadow it's, it was very similar on that sort of western boundary but it amazes me how Tundi has kind of moved so far and what she, the reason why she's done that probably is due to the fact that she's trying to keep as stable a male as possible and um, it has been allowed by the fact that females have kind of disappeared as she's been moving but um, you know she's managed to kind of force out other females in some respects and create this little carve this little life for herself where she's got a solid male that roams around and it's an incredible kind of way that she's moved it she's basically followed Mvula's movements in her early stages of life and then towards the later ones has followed Tingana's movements in many respects so kind of interesting how the male also d sort of dictated where she ended up having her cubs and that she's smart enough to be able to move those cubs into those areas has been quite fascinating to watch so ginger no she hasn't had more successful litters than Karula. Uh, Karula um also had five um but she hasn't lost an entire litter like Karula once did so Karula did have a, another litter which was was killed unfortunately um which is six would have made six um I think six, am I right? Six, yes, six. Um, where, so Tundi, if she has this next one and manages to raise them to survival, she would have actually successfully raised um, an extra litter. But in saying that, Karula has raised more cubs um, into to an, a point where they can be adults. Um, so, you know, she managed to raise pretty much every single one of those litters that actually made it bar that, that one that was very, very small. Um, and, and so she's left a huge legacy. The problem with Karula was that they're all boys. Um, so I say all boys, I mean, there was obviously females in the form of Tandi and Shadow and uh, Shongila and... Um, Shavinzi, but there was more boys, unfortunately. And so in Duno, Mishu, Shivambalana, um, Quarantine, Konyuma, and Hosana have all kind of distributed away from her area. And while her legacy has been carried f into different places and her bloodline has been taken other elsewhere, um, it's, it's difficult to follow exactly what's going on. And, it's, and then obviously it's a pity that Shavinzi and Shungila and Shadow have all kind of disappeared and 
means that Tandi and her sort of lineage is what's left of the female sort of hierarchy. Um, so it's going to be, you know, Kuchava and Klalamba who are going to carry the baton forward at this stage. Um, that's, of course, if Tandi, you know, if she has another set, she might have some females and hopefully they grow up. I'm really hoping that Tandi's next set is two again um, and that both, you know, if she has two girls, it would be quite nice um, if they grow up in this area. Although I think another young boy also wouldn't be that bad, let's be honest. It's not like Tamba and Wasana, we're not an absolute joy to spend time with. So it'd be nice if, if we had females, though. Again, it's always good when you get lots of females. It means that the area is, is rich with them and, and generally females, you know, stick around. So you always want that kind of going forward. You don't really want too many boys coming through. Um, but it's been interesting in the Sabi Sands is how many litters I've seen that contain young males. And I wonder if it's a, in some ways a response to the population being so dense that having too many females means that there's more competition and somehow their bodies, you know, manage to figure it out. And I would love to know what the sort of ratio has been between male and female offspring in the last 10 years in the Sabi Sands versus 20, 30 years ago um, as to how many boys or girls were being had by the females. It would be very, very interesting to kind of compete or compare and see if the increased population um, has led to, you know, more boys being born or, or more females. I say boys, but I mean males or females. But it's nice that we at least have a couple young females around, you know, Sabuiz, young female, um, obviously little Klalamba here. And then, of course, Shadulu. We know one is definitely a female, but the other one we're not so sure. Samantha, you're asking how I remember all of this stuff? Well, I luckily have some very, very kind people out there that help me remember these things. So there's many of you that obviously keep up tabs with what's going on and, you know, help us with dates and those kind of things. And, you know, I suppose leopards is, is something that I'm very passionate about. And so I try and remember as much as I can about them. And having been able to witness a lot of what we're talking about has really kind of allowed for me to kind of gain well gain and also um retain that information in many respects because it's you know things that you don't forget it's, it's nice when you get to see leopards with their little ones and you watch this sort of change in dynamics and those kind of things and so i've just been very fortunate i suppose that i've managed to spend a lot of time in this area and seen a lot of different leopards and changes and be able to see different behaviors and kind of figure out sort of ways and sort of dates and those kind of things from there. But it's, uh, like I say, I mean, uh, I, you know, it's it's a group effort really at Safari Live in terms of what we know. Um, you guys are just as helpful as anybody else in many respects. Um, I've, you know, learned a lot from many of you and have figured things out through a lot of you. I mean, the, the whole hook and worry story is no thanks to any of us at Safari Live or anyone within the Sabi Sands. If it wasn't for um, Michael, who's, uh, you know, an avid viewer for him kind of trolling through hours and hours of work on f pictures on Facebook of various leopards and picking up Hukumuri down in the south, we would never have even known. So, like I say, group efforts and from that we all gain information and that's why it's so special to be part of this. It's it's very different from just hosting guests on a game drive. Um, you guys have got just as much experience in, in many respects on some things. Good. Anyway, we're going to keep sitting here. We'll hope that little Clalumba wakes up. In the meantime, though, if we've got any other leopard-related questions, we might as well delve deeper into them. Um, and so you think of some, and in the meantime, let's send you back up to Pat in the Mara. Yeah, still just making my way on through here as I have some red-necked spur fowl in front of the car, making this drive a little bit slower. <laughs> every time, every time these ground birds get in front of the wheels, they just seem to think the only way to escape is by continually going straight up oh, and there one goes. Very nice. So that's how ground birds as well will fly off or how they generally move. It's just a short burst very short burst of speed and then they will glide so it will be a quick succession of the feathers rah, 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 and then they'll just do a glide and so it's, it's effective in that they can travel at fast pace over a short distance so it does help it to get away from predators but uh, sometimes they just seem to take to running forwards and so it's starting to get dark out here. We can see that those uh, clouds are looming. It looks like it's just starting to come over where our camp is on the escarpment. So, well, 
Welcome back to the Mara Lauren. He'll be getting a nice gift soon, I'm sure. Face full of rain. Uh, yes, uh, yes, Emma, those spur fowl that do like the camera, I think. So the jackals, I think blackback jackals also like the camera. They love getting in front of the vehicle and just walking at their own pace as if there is nothing behind them. The brave, brave blackback. It's quite refreshing when it comes in cloudy in the afternoon. I'm probably going to regret saying that soon when the rain does come, but at the moment it's... Um, when the, I mean, when we were in the beaming sun all day and then that bit of cloud cover comes in, that light kind of fresh breeze really helps to keep things cool and, uh, well, the mind starts to slow down a little bit and stop squinting at everything because of all the glare. You can actually open your eyes and look properly. And it helps me as well. I get these, uh, I don't even know how to describe them. Well, I get the, like, eye floaters and these weird flashing lights all over my eyes when it's too bright. And so it makes it quite hard to find things. So I like it when there's a little bit of shade uh, around here. And uh, somewhere where there is plenty of shade is a Juma Game Reserve, and someone who is walking around at the Juma Game Reserve is Jamie. Well, I don't have to worry too much about shade because it's actually thoroughly overcast here as well. And there's not much in the way of sunlight. So yes, I suppose in a way we are in the shade. We're in the shade of the entire cloud bank that has blown over the sands over the sort of last 24 hours or so and left us sort of gloomy and grey, very flat light. Very difficult to record promos for a TV show when everything is just flat and grey and miserable looking. Anyway, uh, we spoke earlier about the track from the Ant Line and somebody guessed, I can't remember who you were, I'm really sorry, I'm a bit dazed and confused, but you asked about the, the track and suggested it might be an ant trail. This is what an ant trail looks like. It is much thicker, much longer. Now, there's a couple of things that an ant trail could be mistaken with. One is a, or four. One is a snake, a snake moving through an area. And act, this trail actually goes from one ant entrance hole to another. So there's a whole nest underneath the ground here. It is ants. It's not termites. It's definitely ants. And they really like Zoe's Road for some reason. A snake is one, a puff adder, for example, uh, a drag mark of something, whether it's a stick being dragged by an elephant or an elephant tip of elephant's trunk or whatever. The key here to determining whether or not something is an ant trail or not is to look at this. Something like this little stone over here. Now, because it is made not by something, one big thing dragging, but by the passage of hundreds of thousands of little feet, stones and things actually stay in one place. So if I take, uh, I should have thought this through. This isn't going to be a good example. Uh, oh, well, there's nothing. Oh, there's something wide. Hold on. So if I take something like this, and I drag it quite lightly, along the ground. What you'll find uh, would be a good example. What you'll find is that you actually end up with little rocks being moved out of the way. Of course I chose a spot with no little rocks. But they almost leave trails where they've been dragged. Where ants actually walk around the little rocks. I should have dragged in a different spot where there was a good example of that. But ants actually walk around little obstacles like this rock. So if this were a drag mark, what you'd find is that it's been shifted and that you get a bit of a mark there. So ant trails are quite easily, they're smooth. They're not jagged in any way. They're beautifully smooth and evened out. Like a highway. Yes, like a highway, exactly. It looks like a highway, like a hundred of thousands of millions probably, because of course each ant has three legs. Little feet have made a passage over time. And this is interesting. I always find it fascinating on Zoe's Road. Sometimes you can see these ant highways leading all the way from one end of Zoe's to another, connecting these little holes below 
the surface of the road. And it's made by these tiny, or at least I don't know if it was made, or entrails are, I don't know if this nest was made, but these tiny, tiny little red ants. And I'd love to actually be able to see below the surface of the soil, because I don't actually know what goes on down there. You know, at least with, with termites that are fungus growers, macrotermies, we know exactly what it looks like down there, but it does. It creates these beautiful, intricate little nests, and I don't know. I don't know what they look like inside, and I don't know how deep they go. I imagine pretty deep. It would be very cool to find out. Now, we often speak about what animal we'd be for a day, and we always talk about being a leopard or an elephant or maybe a bird if you're feeling adventurous. Perhaps you'd like to go for a little bit of a, a flap around Juma. It might be quite cool to be an ant. Imagine. Go down here for the day, cruise around all those little corridors. Maybe it's a bit monotonous, I don't know. Probably actually a bit monotonous. Emma says it would be hard work. She's probably right. Uh, you know, unless you get to be the, the queen ant, which probably wouldn't be very exciting either. In fact, I think being, being ant royalty might be, or termite royalty, must be a truly boring experience. Possibly like being human royalty too, at least in the old days. Maybe not anymore, but certainly in the older days. Mm -hmm. No, I take that back. I don't want to be an ant for a day. Or a termite. It definitely sounds like hard work. But I would much rather be lithe and energetic and beautiful like a tlalumba for a day. Because that would be nice. We are indeed with royalty. And royalty is woken up because the Impala's alarm calling behind us. So... Pretty much where we came from earlier, I'm, I'm sure, I'm almost 90% sure it's Tingana. If it's not Tingana, then it must be her mom, Tandi, moving about. Um, you can see it's woken her up as well. She's looking down in that direction to see. But my guess would be Tingana more than anybody else that's milling about down that side of the world. Um, it's exactly where the monkeys were alarm calling the impalas. We also heard a kudu calling that side earlier. So there's definitely another leopard milling about, sort of... In the Mulwati, uh, sounds like roughly the Mulwati, um, in that kind of area. But um, it's nice that she's put her head up. It's definitely at least allowing us to get to see her nicely. She reminds me a lot of Tamba lately. I don't know why her sort of her spots have gotten dark almost, and her coat, coat is gold, and her eyes are a little bit similar. She doesn't have the same ears, but she does look very much like Tlalamba in that kind of coat color. Ravinda, what's going to happen if Tingana comes across Tlalamba now? You can actually hear the Franklins behind us. I wouldn't be surprised if this other leopard shows up in this area anytime soon. So, Ravinda, um, I don't think anything, really. I'm pretty sure that Tingana and Tlalamba are often being kind of seen or are often meeting up in this area. There's so much movement of these leopards that they have to bump into each other from time to time. He will recognize her smell. Remember, at the end of the day, he has been in this area. He's been in the whole time she's grown up he's come across her scent so he'll know that this is who it is it's, a, it's his daughter she's still young she's not like she's coming into estrus and so for him she, he, she's absolutely zero threat so he's not going to be too aggressive towards her obviously we know he has killed a few female leopards before but I think that's more a case that unfortunately um, she, she, those leopards had been mating with, potentially mating with other males or bumped into other males um, and he didn't know the smell and so that's what's driven him to be as aggressive as he was to those those little females but um, you know I, I think she's perfectly fine, I don't think she needs to worry too much about um, Tingana in fact for her safety and for her survival Tingana is going to be hugely important um, because he's going to maintain this sort of boundary in this area which will prevent the likes of Hukumuri, the skittish man um, whoever it may be from coming in here and they will be a lot more of a threat to her at this age because she's not sexually mature yet she's not able to mate and therefore is potentially at risk of being killed by those males or even rival females so you know she needs Tingana to be around and to be making sure all these others move off now in terms of that skittish male I actually really would like to see him I'm, I think the last guide here at Safari Live that hasn't seen him um, and so I'm looking forward to the day that I do get to see him and I actually sent a message to all the other rangers in the area to see if we can actually start to think about giving him some sort of identity because saying skittish male is just ridiculous um, you know there's many other skittish 
leopards out here so it gets all a bit confusing after a while so hopefully we'll, there'll be some sort of resolution on that it's not our choice unfortunately so we just need to ask um, but the guy said they will address it at the next rangers meeting so let's see what happens um, but he's probably like i said the, the biggest threat at the moment um, on this southern boundary to Tlalamba, and it's probably why she's been hanging out so much further north of late Rima, you most certainly will probably hear him. Um, you know, Hukumuri is not exactly quiet when he comes into this area. He's very vocal when he's sent marking. Um, and so she'll hear that and, and probably move off in the opposite direction. Um, which, which is quite strange because in a few years' time, if she's in Eastress, she'll go towards it, which is which is pretty crazy. But um, for now, you know, she would move away from that. Um, it's probably why, like I say, she's been spending so much time sort of on the northeastern side of Juma. That's the safest point. That's where Tingana's been a lot. Um, she'll hear Tingana's call and know she's perfectly safe under his kind of cloud or his sort of banner. And so where he's calling is nothing she needs to worry about. Um, if she hears other males and then remember that they're hearing as much as we like to fool ourselves and think that we're the most intelligent species out here, um, their hearing is insanely good. And they can tell very quickly who's calling it's much like us we know different voices and she if it's something she doesn't really know she's not going to go towards it um so that's the nice thing about male leopards when they're territorial and when they're patrolling what she's got to be careful of is that she doesn't bump into him on a kill or something like that because then she's going to have a bit more of a, a problem um but yes hukumuri i suppose is is something that she'll definitely be able to recognize as danger um the amount of times her mom had to march her away from hukumuri when she was younger is huge i mean this time last year is is kind of when hukumuri was really sort of pushing in and they had been forced heavily sort of towards torchwood and into even as close as buffles i mean up to as far north as buffles hook um and so she'll remember those days and, and probably will know full well that she needs to be very very careful and in fact remember this time last year was just before i went to the mara and we were seeing hukumuri right where we're sitting right now he i don't think he's been seen in this area now for uh, months but you know at that time he was moving all over this section he was even moving as far as Torchwood at one point um, and so you know she'll know full well that he's dangerous just from the way Tandy um, behaved around him and when he called and those kind of things now Emma from Final Control in Johannesburg is saying that Tlalam has developed the Tandy side eye she does have a good sort of side eye stare doesn't she um, I wonder if she's going to be snarly like her mom when she gets cubs. It'll be interesting because often leopards can take on traits of their moms when they have their cubs. Um, and I wonder if she's going to be snarly um, and sort of hissy like Tandy can be sometimes. Um, she certainly doesn't display that in normal sort of circumstances. Um, she's normally very, very chilled, as you can see. Um, when when it's just her and she's around but cubs change everything and so you never know i mean maybe she'll become a lot more aggressive when she does have cubs and she'll be a lot more sassy like her mom her mom has certainly got the sass smile down completely with those teeth bearing at you although she's been fairly chilled of late i haven't seen too many kind of hisses or snarls at anyone of late um she seems to be getting softer in her old age um she's one of those leopards that you always have to warn new guides about as to your proximity to her and the fact that she is not tolerant of many things and on one day she'll be fine and the next day she'll not be fine and that's just how Tandy is and like I say it's one of my favorite things about her is you're constantly on her toes with on your toes with her you never know really where you stand and um one day it's okay to kind of follow behind her the next day it's not and you've just got to wait until you're being told off and then you just back off and everything is okay so she's she's funny like that but i really do wish we saw more of her over the last few weeks i mean it's been tough to find her although i suppose everybody else has been seeing her tandy has been showing herself to rusty and various others um so maybe it's just me maybe we have to reconcile a little bit at some point anyway um, we'll keep spending time with her daughter maybe she'll arrive here at some point in the meantime though back up to pat and the lions see if they've woken up and see if they're up to anything yes looking for them i am unsuccessfully i uh i have to admit i did take the wrong road so they are in an area where it's just kind of a connection of dirt tracks and I haven't really ever been around here too much. I mean, I've poked my head in here once or twice, but I'm not overly familiar with it. So I'm just uh, getting my bearings at the moment. 
as the sky is turning blacker and blacker and the wind is starting to pick up. I can definitely feel some weather starting to move in. Whew, it's getting quite blustery actually. The temperature drops are quite severe with the rains the last few days. It'll go from very hot to very cold in an instant. It's like a cold snap almost. And well, I came underprepared. I forgot my jumper and my jacket. I just realized that just then. So <laughs> I'm going to be a cold, cold boy tonight, I think, especially if this storm comes in. Very rookie error. Very, very rookie error, Emma. I, I uh, don't even have an excuse. I don't have an excuse at all. It's usually just habit just grab everything and chuck it in the car but well today I did forget oh well I made the mistake I shall pay for it never a failure always a lesson and the lesson is bring your bring your bloomin jumper Patrick bloomin is another Australian word <laughs> MGN any luck with some giraffe today well I did see a few when I was coming down but they haven't been around today. I saw heaps and heaps yesterday, but uh, you know, not many giraffe today. Aha, uh -huh, here we go. Here they are. Very nice. All right. Where did I come in last time? I think it was here. Ah, oh, yep, there it is. Hello, gals. This is actually very very nice when we get up we'll see that they're just all three heads are just sticking out of a bush right now Ah, Lara Moore, I haven't gotten myself a shooker yet. I've been borrowing some, but I haven't actually gotten one for myself. It's uh, very hard to get cash out up here in uh, in the wilderness, and so so I haven't been had any cash to actually buy myself a shooker with. But I do need to get one before I go. I'm I'm leaving on Tuesday, and uh, sorry about my head there, everyone. I'm leaving on Tuesday and I need to get one before I go because I'm sure it will be very handy to take it with me wherever I go, especially I'm going to Cape Town on my leave and I think it's going to get quite chilly down there, especially the water. Actually, shooker would be, shooker would be perfect for uh, coming out of the surf after going bodyboarding or surfing. Uh, I use sometimes a poncho towel, but I suppose you could Real, no, for after, for after. So there's poncho towels, but I, th I think you could probably make a sugar into a bit of a poncho towel as well. That would be very warm. Ah, so I'm glad to have found these lines, but I am really wondering where this mail is. So, ah, mm hmm. hmm. I'm sorry, I keep putting my head in the way when I come up to peak here. Rosemary, these girls are beautiful. I am infatuated by them. So, so majestic. I absolutely love my lionesses. And, uh, well, it's interesting to see between the leopard and the lion, the backs of the ears and the tips of the tail. In a lion, they are black, and in a leopard, they are white. I think that's got to, well, it seems like it would have to do with the actual way that their body looks. So the leopard do, do have those black spots, and so the white would stick out, whereas lions are almost just the one color over the top, or they're a lot more solid than leopards anyway, and so the black would stand out more against the lighter ones, especially for lionesses like uh, lychee, wherever. It's a bit hard to distinguish the three at the moment, but uh, yeah, Lychee does have a lighter coat and so the black would probably stand out even more for her. As we do know, Butternut is off. I'm, I, I would assume she would have been finished with her mating now though.
So everyone wants to know if the rest of the females have names. Well, they're kind of all unofficially named. So Lychee is the oldest lioness, and she's called that because she's lighter. And then Butternut's two daughters. There is Papaya and the ridged nose female. So we can see the on the right hand side here. We can see that those there's pretty prominent ridges there. And so, although. Yeah, I'm just looking at these three lions. These might not be the Owinos. I'm just second guessing myself here now because when I first came across them, I'm sure I saw Lychee. I mean, it was that white coat. She had the same look about her, but I'm just starting to, I can't see. When we looked closely at that nose there, it just didn't look like those prominent ridges that I'm used to seeing on on the ridge nose female. And anyway, and the other door that we call Papaya, uh, but that's kind of not an official name, I don't think, I'm not sure. But again, because of her coat. But yeah, now I'm starting to wonder if this is, I mean, where we are, it should be. And where, when I first saw them, I mean, I swore that was Leechy leading them. If only, if, I mean, that's usually the dead giveaway for the Owinos is that pale male, the very light coloured male that always hangs around them. But I mean, if it isn't, if it isn't the Owino girls, I don't know who else it could really be. We're way too far up or down for it. We are up for it to be the Salt Lake Pride. Uh, the Ololulos, uh, probably not. We probably see some more with them. So I'm still, I'm still pretty sure this is o, the Owinos, but I'm just not 100% confident at the moment. But while I mull over it and try and figure it out, let's go back down to Jamie. We're on Zoe's Road, and what we've been doing for now is retracing Hukumori's steps from yesterday. Because what we've worked out, or what we've noticed, is that he is a phenomenal creature of habit with the roots that he walks, which Tingana used to be as well in the beginning. If I remember correctly, from the sort of early days when I started in 2015, I remember Tingana walking very, very set roots, one of which was this, actually the Zoe Rose, Zoe, blah, 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 Zoe's Road Patrol. So what Hukumori does is he comes up here, north along Zoe's, and then somehow magics himself to across a road called Power Lines, which, believe it or not, is where Power Lines are, and then onto a place, a road called Voyatella Access. From there, he goes straight up Voyatella Access to Aubrey's Road, which is what we predicted yesterday. But what we didn't have up until yesterday, and now we do, thanks to Herbie, is the in-between stage from here to Voyatella Access. Because when I was tracking him yesterday, I couldn't find his tracks coming out of the junction of this road. And what Herbie's told me is that he's pointed out almost exactly the spot, actually not almost exactly, exactly the spot where Hukumori goes off and he moves through the silver cluster leaf thicket and then to a big termite mound in this thicket over here. There's two and we know both of them and he moves from the termite mound to the next termite mound, then across power lines and onto Voyatella Access. And that immediately tells me that yesterday Hukumori watched me drive pa straight past him without any concerns at all because he was somewhere here. The grass is so long at the moment and the leopard's so well hidden that it was sort of, you know, par for the course essentially that he was going to do that. Difficult. It's difficult to spot, spot leopards. So what we started doing which is actually quite a depressing tone for this conversation to take. So we started talking about how many leopards we've driven past, because Seb was talking about the fact that it'll be interesting with a drone to see how many we do drive past at night, as would potentially have happened yesterday with Thalamba. Seb thinks we might not have seen her. I'm really hoping that's not the case, because she was right next to the road. And if we, didn't, if we weren't going to see her, then that tells me that I've driven past far more leopards than I've ever thought that I did. But we're trying to put a number to it, and we can't. Thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe not hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands sounds a bit extreme. 10,000 in years? 
cumulatively 10,000 10,000 in 10 years that's a lot of leopards but no maybe that's too much 10,000 in 10 years a thousand a year probably much well, I'm going to do some thinking about that because I'm actually not quite sure. So while I depress myself thinking about just how many leopards I've driven past, apparently Pat nearly drove past his lions, but fortunately he didn't. Yes, well, I did actually almost drive past him as, as one gets a face full of bottom there. So I had a look again. So it, the one that just laid down does definitely seem to be lychee. So there's, there's some scarring on the face that's very similar to what she has. But the thing that's just throwing me off is these two young'uns, one of them usually has very prominent ridges down the sides of each nose. Now this middle one, it kind of looks like that, but... But uh, anyway, well, I'll, uh, yeah. I'll uh, try and piece together this mystery, but it is time to close this one and swap over to the school drive. So thanks for joining on this afternoon sunset safari. And if you want to stay and watch the school drive, you are more than welcome to join us and the Kidlips. We hope to see you all then.